welcome to my studio, aka my home. I'm gonna talk to you about a subject that I have spent the better part of my life pursuing, and that is painting. Now I've had these paintings on my wall for uh, over six months, and it's time for me to like take them off, actually finish them up, finish some hair, finish some arms, finish a few things, and then replace them with a new set of, uh, they're not canvases, they're gessoed paper, and do a new set of paintings. So I thought maybe you would find this process interesting. Now these videos are not meant to be instructional. I'm not here to teach you how to paint, because every painter that I've met has their own process and way of painting. We share some things in common, but we differ in a lot of the particulars. But over the course of the time that I have been painting, I have picked up a few things that I hope that you might find interesting. Now, I've been painting for about 35 years, and that's painting in oils. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about my process and, uh, I don't know, a few other things that you might find interesting. Since the dawn of history, going all the way back to the earliest civilizations, painters held a role of great importance. We were storytellers, documentarians. We depicted the imagery for which a largely illiterate audience could understand mythology, religion, historical events. It was like the painter would be considered, back in those days, the modern day filmmaker, photographer, photojournalist, and even YouTube star. And it was in fact the camera that rendered our utility obsolete. By the turn of the 20th century, art no longer had utilitarian value. Artists had an existential crisis. What was our reason for being? Painters had an existential crisis. What was our reason for being? And about this time, a phrase came into popularity. Art for art's sake. Meaning that art was valuable in and of itself. It didn't have to have another purpose. This was sort of the beginning of the modernist movement. And it's best summed up by a painting by the artist Rene Magritte, who made a painting which is titled, This is Not a Pipe. Since then, artists have continued to embrace new mediums, theories, and ideas about art, culture, and life itself. Artists' materials range from anything under the sun, to light, to sound, to even the human body, pushing the notions of what art is into the future. Out of all the varying disciplines of digital artists, conceptual artists, those who create installations and digital projections and everything else, interdisciplinary artists, painters remain a peculiar group. While all the other artists tend to look forward into the future, painters tend to look back into the past even if their subject matter is contemporary. The weight of art history sits on a painter's shoulders. And there's not one painter that I know that doesn't carry on a conversation with some painter from the past, either a painter from 100 years ago, 400 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. We all have these painting predecessors to look back towards and think about their style, think about the way they painted, think about how they did something, and have this internal dialogue of how did you do what that person did, or how am I commenting on what that person did. It's, it's again, it goes to this peculiar aspect of painters. We are weighted by history because our materials are born from a legacy that go back to the dawn of modern humankind. A 
across the Eurasian continent, in islands in Indonesia, in northern Australia, and even in South America, cave paintings hold the visual artifacts of our prehistoric ancestors. Scientists date these paintings between 11,000 and 44,000 years ago, the oldest being the ones that were found in Indonesia. The most famous, of course, that we know were the ones found in southern uh, France. There's a great movie by Werner Herzog called Caves of Forgotten Dreams. So there's this one vignette of lions painted with charcoal and scientists using their various dating methods determined that an artist or several artists had made the first group of lions and then 5,000 years later another artist came by and added to these lions. So talk about the weight of history. Even our prehistoric ancestors were having these long conversations with their painting predecessors. In Spain there was a set of caves found in which scientists determined that they were painted 65,000 years ago. Now here's the catch. Modern humans did not arrive, did not migrate from Africa to Europe until around 44,000 years ago, which is why we have these paintings dated from that period. So this set of paintings from 65,000 years ago, scientists have determined that they must have been made by our closest Homo sapien relatives, which were the Neanderthals. And we know that the Neanderthals and the humans interacted because modern humans carry a small percentage of DNA from the Neanderthals. So we made it. What happened to the Neanderthals? They died out. But how did they die out? The first theory, of course, is that humans with our frontal lobes, so big, so smart, so clever, we outwitted them, outhunted them. Of course, there's another theory in which that humans carried viruses for which the Neanderthals had no immunity. Now, apropos to us in quarantine dealing with this current pandemic, history repeats itself. What do the cave paintings mean? That's what historians always ask. What do, do these things mean? There's basically three categories for these cave paintings. Geometric design, animal forms, and human handprints. So human handprints put against the cave wall and paint splattered against them. These handprints exist across all of the cave paintings. And scientists who's, who've measured the size of the hands have determined that many of them were made by women, telling us that our painting ancestors were predominantly women. How we got cut out of art history in the modern era is a different story, which will be revisited later on. In terms of the animals, uh, the idea that they represented part of rituals, some kind of hunting magic. Other theories include the idea that shamans entered these caves and these animals were painted, and the identification of the spirit of these animals with the shamans. A paleoanthropologist, rock art researcher named Genevieve von Petzinger, she proposes that the geometric designs were the first example of graphic art. Graphic art meaning that here's a symbol and it means such and such a thing, and it's not words, right? It's not letters, it's not a uh, sound phonetic alphabet. It is a fully formed idea in a symbol. It shows our early ancestors forming the expression of abstract ideas. They are not art for art's sake. They are expressions of humans' conceptions of time, what happens after we die. It's, it's storytelling, which is another abstracted idea. It's our human projection of our imagination. And she says that quite possibly all of these, Im all of this 
imagery is a kind of beginning of our religious thought, ideas that take us beyond the material realm into this abstracted, larger cosmos. Well, we'll never fully know the meaning behind the prehistoric paintings, what we do know for sure is their palette. These early pigments are still in our modern palettes today. The earth tones such as yellow ochre, raw sienna, which is another earth pigment, and literally earth pigment, we're talking about made from the earth. Burnt sienna is the toasted version of raw sienna. And of course, umber, one of the most invaluable colors on the artist's palette. It's a basic neutral brown. The word umber in Latin means shadow. Also, this pigment was originally mined in Umbria in Italy, hence its name has remained. These pigments form a cornerstone of what we call mineral colors. Mineral colors are highly stable and light fast. Light fast is an arts word that means it doesn't fade very easily. Our prehistoric artists had two types of black, an organic black and a mineral black. Their mineral black was made from a stone called halmenite, containing manganese. In our modern palette, we still have the same type of black, which contains manganese and other iron oxides. We call it Mars black. The organic color, what is organic? Anything that contains carbon. You and me are organic materials. We are made up of carbon. The food we eat is made up of carbon. The fossilized oil in the ground was made from organic material, carbon. So carbon black was easily made by charcoal, the burning of wood, or it was made through the burning of bones. Now, these pigments lasted throughout millennia. In medieval times, these blacks these organic blacks were made from chicken bones, uh, lamb bones, whatever you happen to have eaten for dinner, the bones were taken, charred, the ash was ground, and the pigment was made from that. Or if you wanted to pay more money and get a more fancy bone black, you would go to the ivory collar, you would go to the ivory carver, who might have been doing decorative carvings for an altarpiece or some other jewelry or some fancy thing for a patron and the, those shavings were taken, burned, and turned into what we still call ivory black. So today, this is probably not made of real ivory, it's made of bones. They were both the same uh, ultimate chemistry, but you know, where exactly your material came from in Renaissance time had a certain value to it, so ivory black versus bone black you would have charged the extra cost to your patron if you used ivory black. And another mineral red, hematite, which the Greeks called bloodstone, right? Hematite means bloodstone. And this is the little interesting corollary. Iron oxide means that it's rust, right? The rust of iron is this reddish color. And so the earth having this reddish tone, it's the oxide of iron in the earth that gives it this hue from this warm reddish yellow to red. In our bodies, what do we contain? Iron. So the iron of our body, the iron of the earth, the iron in our pigments, we're all connected to each other. And so this holistic view 
of our materials in us keep us bound to the cosmos in a way that we that we share the life blood of the earth and the human and the painting so when we look back at what maybe our primitive ancestors were were connecting to it doesn't maybe seem so far fetched and strange because looking for meaning is something that modern humans keep striving to do especially in these very uncertain times